And let's start looking at these circuits. The first thing we want to do is we want to define I1 and I2 using Ohm's law. So that's very, it's very simple to do. You can do it this way. So the Ohm's law for these two currents, it's very simple. I1 is equal to V divided by R1 and I2 is equal to V divided by R2. So it's very simple. Again, we don't have any number here, but these are Ohm's law for the resistance R1 and R2. It's basically the, the definition of how a resistor works. Now, the second thing, we want to connect R1 and I2 that we just defined with I. So it's kind of, it's very easy to see what is the result because it's a very simple circuit, but we can apply the, uh, the Kirchhoff current law to be a little bit more rigorous. So what we do, we choose a node. Obviously, we can choose any of the nodes. In this case, let's choose this one. Obviously, it has to be a node where I1 and R2 go. A node used by I1 and I2. A definitely works well for us. And now we're just going to write that is actually very straightforward. I minus I2 minus I1 minus I2 equal to zero. So I'm uh, summing all the current center in the node and subtracting one leaving the node. Everything equal to zero. And this simply tells me that I is equal to I1 plus I2, which is kind of obvious if you look at this and you think at the, at the water equivalent. The water I or the current I is coming into the node. There are two currents coming out of it. So the sum of these two currents has to be the same unless uh, some electron got lost in a way. So now that the final part, it's uh, very similar to what we've done before. The equation of I is um, a function of uh, I1 and I2, but I1 and I2 are defined by the Ohm's law. So we just rewrite the same thing, rewrite the same thing, but just substituting the expression for I1 and I2. V divided by R1 plus V divided by R2. So we have taken these two equations and this equation and combined into one. And now we're very close to the end. As we discussed before, R parallel, R parallel is uh, defined as V divided by I. Let me just call it RP. V divided by I from the second circuit here. From here you can tell it's V divided by I. So the V is the same as the one in the previous circuit and it is an input. So there's really no other way to break it down in smaller pieces. But I, it's a function of R1 and R2, which in turn are a function of R1 and R2. So now we'll just replace I with the new definition of I that we found. V divided by R1 plus V divided by R2. Obviously, you can see that we have V at both numerator and denominator, so that can be simplified. So the final equation that we obtain is the following. Where this part at the end, this is the value of the equivalent parallel resistor. In this slide, I summarize the final result, the final equation needed to calculate the parallel of resistor. Again, on the left, we have an hypothetic circuit with n resistor in parallel. The number of the resistor could be any. It could be 100 resistor, 10 resistor, 3 resistor. Doesn't matter. And on the other side, we have the equivalent parallel resistor. And this one is the equation that you need to use to calculate it. So as we've seen before, the way you do it is you take the inverse of each of the resistance. You sum all the inverses and then you do the inverse of the whole thing. So this one is a little bit more complicated than this resistor in series, but I mean, not too much. It is manageable. Also, many times you won't really have many resistors in parallel. Many times it will just be two resistors most of the time. So there is a simplified version of this equation. Like if you just have two resistors in this, so you only have R1 and R2 and you kind of play a little bit with the math. There is like an easy, easier version, at least easier to remember. So R parallel, in that case, become R1 multiplied by R2 divided by R1 plus R2. So this one is a little bit easier to remember, at least for me. And honestly, it's the one that you use most of the time. I want to stress a concept that is really important before we move on. 
what does it mean equivalent here when we say equivalent parallel resistance? Because obviously, if we take this circuit and change it into this one, the circuits are not equivalent anymore. We even have a different number of components. How could they be equivalent? What the equivalent word means is that this network of components behave exactly the same way as this individual component from the point of view of the external circuit. So this, it's a little bit of a mouthful, but let me, let me just explain with a very simple circuit. So if we have a battery generator connected, our usual battery generator, you could see this network of resistances as one big component. Now, the battery source, the, bat the voltage generator, doesn't know what it is connected to. The only thing it knows is that it applies a voltage across these components. So you have zero volt here and V volts here. And as a result of that, there is a certain current I that is requested out of the voltage generator. From a point of view of the voltage generator, whether this component is made of N resistor or it's made of just one resistor, there's no difference as long as the required current is the same. There's no way this voltage source has a way to understand that there's only one resistor instead of 10. So this is what the equivalent word means. It's equivalent from the point of view of the rest of the circuit. Now, if you consider the overall circuit, obviously these two circuits are not equivalent anymore. Here we have N plus one components, including the battery source, the, the voltage generator. And in the other case, we will only have two components, the voltage source and the parallel resistor. So this is a really important concept. The equivalent parallel and serial resistance is a very useful concept. Most of the time it's just used to simplify the, calcul the mathematical calculation because if you knew what is the equivalent value of this parallel resistor, it will be much easier for you to calculate the current given a voltage. Whereas if you don't do, if you don't know what is the equivalent parallel resistance, every time I change the voltage, to know what is the current I, you will have to calculate the current in each of the resistor, then sum it up all together, and then you can tell me what is the value of I. So that is one of the usage of the equivalent parallel and serial resistor. Other times, you might actually calculate the value so that you can replace many components with a fewer number of components, but it's very important to stress that that is not a must. doesn't make necessarily a circuit better than another. Each case is different. In this lesson, we're going to talk about voltage dividers. Voltage divider in the simplest form is simply made of two resistors in series. And the goal of a voltage divider is to take a larger voltage, which could be battery voltage in this case, or any other voltage, and divide that large voltage into different smaller voltages, like in this case, V2 and V1. And all the output voltages, obviously, are a fraction of the input voltage accordingly to the Kirchhoff voltage law. The value of V1 and V2, it's easy to calculate. From the Kirchhoff voltage law, we know that the sum of V1 and V2 has to be equal to Vbat. So Vbat is equal to V1 plus V2. And in order to calculate the value of V1 and V2, we can simply do the following. So we remember that the equivalent series resistance over 1 and R2 is equal to the sum of R1 and R2. So Rs, we can call it, is R1 plus R2. Then we calculate the current that is going through the series of these two resistors, just like this. And the value of the current will be equal to the V baht divided by R1 plus R2 which is the series resistance. And then finally, we have the current going through the two resistor, so we should be able to calculate the two final voltages. So the two final results, V1, will be equal to Vb, instead of Vb, just for short, R1, R1 plus R2, and V2 is equal to Vb, R2, R1, plus R2. The same idea can be extended for a larger number of resistors. So if you have your supply here, but instead of having only two resistors, you have four of them. Now, as a result, you're going to have four voltages that you, that you can pick. 
this resistance will be R1, R2, R3, R4, this one I call it V in this time, and now you're going to have V1, V2, V3, and V4. The sum of these resistor, of these voltages is going to be equal to V in again for the Kirchhoff voltage law. And you can use a generic equation to calculate the, the voltage across each one of the resistor. So the voltage, so the Vx for the voltage across any generic resistor X will be equal to Rx, so the value of the resistor, divided by the sum, so R1 plus R2 plus Rn, so all the resistors that you have in the voltage divider, obviously multiply by the input voltage. So this equation gives you an idea of how things go and the fact that the voltage across one resistor compared to the other is uh, proportional to how big is the resistance of the resistor compared to the other resistor in the voltage divider. For example, if you have a voltage divider made just with two resistors and the resistors are the same, the voltage will be equally split between the two resistors. If you have three resistors that are all the same, you will have one third of the voltage on each of the resistors and so on. Instead, if you have, for example, a resistor that is 10 times as bigger than, as the other, and you have only two resistors, you will have that 1 11th of the voltage will go on the smaller resistor, and 10 11th of the voltage will go to, with the larger resistor. Voltage dividers can be made using a different number of resistors. You start with a minimum value, which is 2, but then you can have 4, 3, 5, 10, as, as many as you want in principle. The idea is that by increasing the number of resistors, you get a higher number of output voltages. Now, I want to make a few comments on this. First of all, remember that the total sum of all the voltages on the resistors is going to be equal to the input voltage. So if you increase the number of resistors too much, you're just going to get very, very tiny voltages. Also, these voltages are going to be not very accurate. The resistors themselves are not very accurate. When we say the resistor is 1 kilo ohm, uh, usually, when you actually buy a component, it will come with a certain tolerance, for example, plus minus 5%. It also changes with temperature a little bit. If you're trying to just divide the voltage roughly by 2, that is fine. You can use a voltage divider. But if you're trying to get very precise values of voltages, and many of them, then you're going to get quite surprising results. I want to revisit the equation for voltage divider a little bit because when we calculated it, we made a bigger assumption, a big unspoken assumption that it's important to highlight because it really determines whether your circuit will work or not. The assumption that we made is that R1 and R2 or whatever, how many resistors you use for your voltage divider are in series with each other. So they are crossed by the same current. So for this example here, what that means is that the current given or taken by the central terminal is equal to zero. It doesn't matter what happened at this terminal or at this terminal. The one at the very top and the one at the very bottom can have as much current as they want because they are connected straight to a battery. So the battery will guarantee that the voltage stays the same. But the voltage in the central terminal is supposed to be zero. If that is not equal to zero, your equation is not valid anymore. You might wonder, well, is it that a problem? We'll just have to calculate a different equation. Well, let me give you an example. Let's say most of the time, that current in the central tower will be different to zero because you're not using the voltage divider simply to create that V2 voltage, but your plan is actually to use that V2 voltage to do something. For example, let's say you have a, a battery voltage that is 4 volts and it's too high for your chip. So you have a chip that really needs 1.8 volt to work. So now you do your math uh, to size R1 and R2 and then you find out what is the value that you need to get 1.8 volt. After you've done that, you complete your circuit by connecting your chip. So the chips, uh, usually, they always want to be connected to ground. So they have a ground terminal. And then they have another pin, which is called VCC or VDD, which is the power supply. So now you connect it. The problem now is that this chip, in order to work, will, will need a current that is different than zero. If this current were to be constant, then we you could probably live with it because you will be able to redo a different equation considering that some current is stolen from R1 by this integrated circuit. And then you do you will have a, a new revised equation that tells you what is the value of R1 and R2 that you need to have to have 1.8 volts. That we say we want to have here. The problem with that is that chips, circuit, but in general, pretty much almost anything you can connect there 
problems that the Canada they need in order to work usually changes with time. It's not cost. You know, if you look at an integrated circuit, in particular a digital one, the current that they need during the time will be something like this. It will, it will keep changing really fast. It will go from zero when the chip is not doing anything to a really high current when the, when the circuit is uh, like switching and, and doing operation. And the problem with that is that then you will have variable voltage across V2. And uh, it's going to be really, really, really hard to guarantee that that voltage will stay equal to the desired 1.8 volt. Well, how can you solve the problem of um, a voltage divider where the central top is actually using some current? Well, there are two ways to approach this. So the first way is don't use VD, the voltage divider, if the current is different than zero. <laughs> so pretty much, this doesn't tell you much, but what I'm, what I'm trying to say is that use the voltage divider only in cases where the current and the central top is, is zero. So there are cases where that is true. For example, if you connect that to an input pin of a digital chip, the input pin most likely will have a practically zero current. So in that case, uh, the voltage divider will work. Or for example, if you connect it to a comparator or, you know, there are kind of applica some application that really truly requires zero current. Or for example, if you really, your goal is just to generate that voltage V2 for, I don't know, educational purposes. And the only thing you're going to do with it is just to connect a multimeter between the two terminal. So instead of having uh, an IC here, you're just going to connect a multimeter to measure the voltage. Then uh, the current is, is basically zero. The second thing that you can do to a working voltage divider is to make sure that the I bias is much bigger than the max of the absolute of I load. Now what I mean with that is the following. So the I load is the current that you need to have going into your load in order to do something with it. As I said before, you're most likely using a voltage divider to generate an intermediate voltage from the battery voltage. And you want to connect a load there, connect a device, which could be a resistor, a chip, something that needs that voltage in order to work. So if we call this load, the current that this device needs is called I load. This current could be positive, negative. We cannot make a, an assumption now because we don't know what the load looks like, but we have to be able somehow to calculate what is the maximum absolute value that the current will ever have, either positive or negative. We, we need to know what it is. And if we can tell uh, what the value of the, the maximum value of the current uh, is, we can make sure that that is much smaller than I bias. And when I say much smaller, I mean at least 100 times smaller. So the I bias is the following. So the I bias is the current that goes through, actually let me represent it like this, that goes through R1 and R2. So uh, obviously the current that goes in R1 and R2 is not exactly the same. But if we can assume that I load is much, much smaller than our bias, than the current going in R1, then the current going in R2 is going to be pretty much the same as R1, because from the Kirchhoff current law, you know that the current in R2 is equal to the current in R1 minus I load in this case. So if it's much smaller, it's practically equivalent to zero. So we can say that the current in R1 and R2 is the same. It's practically as if they were in series. And the value of the current across them will be simply given by VBAT divided by R1 plus R2. So if that is the case, the equation that we calculated before still doesn't really apply mathematically, it's not perfect anymore, but because the amount of current that the load will steal from the voltage divider is really tiny compared to the one going down through the voltage divider, the so-called I bias, then we can pretty much neglect it. And we can say that the voltage V2 will pretty much always gonna be around the value that we designed the voltage divider for. If you look at this equation here that we calculated for Vx, uh, but in general, if you think about the relationship for these two, for V2, V2 is equal to Vbat R2 divided R1 plus R2. So you will notice something very interesting. So the voltage divider is pretty much agnostic on the absolute value of the resistance. All the voltage divider care is about the relative value of the resistance. In this case, if R1 is equal to R2, you're always going to have the V2 is equal to half VBAT. Now, that means that R1 and R2 could be equal to 1 ohm, 
Uh, they could be one kilo ohm, uh, one mega ohm, or 10 mega ohm, or whatever you want. You still get the same result. The reality, the practice of engineering here, uh, tells you that you can really choose any value of resistance that you want, because while that will mathematically work, it will have some serious limitation of your real circuit. You can choose value of resistor that are either too small or too big. If you choose a value of the resistor that's too small, you're going to have a big bias current going through your voltage divider. And that is generally undesirable for several reasons. First of all, if this voltage generator is really a battery, you're going to be draining the battery very quickly for no reason. Secondly, having a pretty big current, uh, most likely is going to mean that you have a big power dissipated on the resistors. Remember that the power dissipated is square of the current multiplied by the resistor. And that means that your resistor will have to be pretty fat because otherwise it will heat up quite a bit and it could even, could even burn. On the other hand, you also don't want to choose a value of resistance that's too high. First of all, very high value of resistance is difficult to find. And in addition to that, if you choose a value of resistance that's too high, the problem with that is that you're going to have a very, very, very uh, tiny, tiny bias current going through your voltage divider because remember that the I bias is roughly equal to B bar divided by R1 plus R2 in this example. So if R1 and R2 are too big, the I bias would be very small. And if the I bias is really small, first of all, you're very likely not respecting condition number two, which means that you really have to have zero current from the central tap for this voltage divider to work. And secondly, even if you really have zero voltage, the problem is uh, you're always going to have some noise injected in your circuit by other appliances, other electronic tools nearby. For example, if you have a phone or things like that. So they will inject voltage and current in your circuit. And you want a voltage divider to be somewhat solid and robust. And in order to do so, you want decently sized current to go through it. So that even if there is some external factor, inject a little perturbation, overall your results stay the same. So you want this current to be somewhat significant. So usually the rule of the thumb is to use a value of resistors in the range of kilo ohm, for example, 10 kilo ohm, 5 kilo ohm, up to, I don't know, 100 kilo ohm max kind of, of value. But then again, uh, every circuit is a different story. If you really need to use this voltage divider, but your I load is insignificant, then you should uh, use a smaller value of resistor. Voltage divider is still not really a good way to get a precise reference voltage. Uh, though this might be stated here, I'm also saying that there are serious limitations. So as I highlighted before, resistors have tolerance, so they, they change their value uh, within a certain random range that you never know, and the value of the resistance also change with the temperature, so you can't fully rely on them. Secondly, it's very quick to see that if you really want to use, have any significant load current here, in order to have a stable voltage, you will really have to use very low resistor values. And that is really undesirable because you will end up consuming a lot of current. The voltage divider is good to generate reference voltage only when the current from the load is really, really tiny. And when you don't really don't need to have a precise voltage to begin with, but you just roughly have to have, let's say, half of the input voltage, something like that. Another important assumption that we made that I have not discussed yet on the voltage divider is that the input voltage is constant. That might be the case, depending on your circuit, but most of the time that is not the case. In particular, if you connect as an input voltage a battery like I'm assuming here. The voltage battery is changing quite a bit during the operation. The voltage at 100% charge is much different than the voltage at 50% charge for the battery. And so you will have to be very careful when you design a voltage divider to keep into account that the input voltage might be changing as well. So if your goal of the voltage divider was to generate a voltage that is half the battery voltage, then it doesn't matter that the battery is changing. If you have R1 equal to R2, for example, you're always going to have the output being equal to half the input voltage. But if your goal was to generate an exact value of the voltage, then you're going to be in trouble because as your input voltage is changing over time, so is your output voltages. If you need something precise, stable, something, for example, used to actually supply the voltage to a chip, then you will very likely use something else, probably a voltage regulator. The current divider is the equivalent of the voltage divider before current. With a voltage divider, we had a large voltage and we divided it using resistors. 
Here we have a large current and we divide it in different branches using resistors as well. The simplest form of the current divider is shown on the left. And it's made by two resistors in parallel. The voltage divider is in parallel to a voltage source, a battery in this case, and we have called the overall current from the battery IBAT. The Kirchhoff current law tells us that IBAT will have to split between the two branches of the two resistor. We can call I1 the current in the resistor R1 and I2 the current in the resistor R2. The goal of this lesson is to determine the value of I1 and I2 relative to IBAT. In other words, we want to determine how the current IBAT divides between the two nets of the circuit. R1 and R2 are in parallel, and we know the value of the voltage across them, VBAT. Therefore, it's natural to start by calculating the value of the current I1 and I2. The current I1 is simply equal to VBAT divided by R1, and I2 is equal to VBAT divided by R2. IBAT is also easy to calculate, as it is the current going into the parallel between R1 and R2. I use this symbol to indicate the parallel between R1 and R2. The parallel between R1 and R2 is equal to R1 by R2 divided by R1 plus R2. Now, if we combine these two equations into one, we obtain that I bat is equal to V bat multiplied by R1 plus R2 divided R1 multiplied by R2. Finally, we can calculate the ratio between I1 and I bat and I2 and I bat, which give us the percentage of the current I bat going into R1 and the percentage going into R2. Needless to say that a similar approach can be used to find the value of the current in voltage dividers with more than two branches. These equations that we have just calculated are similar to the one of the voltage divider, but there is a fundamental difference. If we had a voltage divider composed by two resistors, R1 and R2, and we wanted to calculate the percentage of V bat falling on R1, the results would have been R1 over R1 plus R2. In the case of the current divider, instead, the portion of I bat going into R1 is R2 divided by R1 plus R2. You see the difference? In the case of the voltage, we put a numerator, the resistor whose voltage drop we are calculating. While in the case of the current, we put the other resistor. You see here we are calculating I1 over I bat and the result is R2 divided by the sum of the resistor. And at the same time, when we want to calculate the current in I2, we have R1 divided by the sum of the resistor. This is the opposite of what you get if you are calculating the voltage over this resistor in a voltage divider. This might seem strange, but it's very intuitive. In the voltage divider, for the same current, a higher resistor takes a larger portion of the input voltage. While in the case of the current divider, 
for the same voltage, the higher the other resistor, the higher is the portion of the current that would prefer to flow in the resistor under study. Current dividers work well when their different branches are truly in parallel with each other. If you were to connect anything in series to any of the resistors, like this, this little box in series to R2, the equations of the current divider that we have just calculated won't be mathematically correct anymore. But it will still be okay as long as the voltage drop across this new element is much smaller than VBAT. I want to spend a few more words on the concept of the path of least resistance. As we've seen before, the current tends to use the path where the resistance is the least. We can see an example of this in the two equations that we have just calculated. These ones. Assume for a minute that R1 is two times as big as R2. So R1 equal 2 times R2. If we replace R1 in both this equation, we get that I1 is equal to I bat divided by 3 and I2 is equal to I bat divided by 3 multiplied by 2. As you can see, two-thirds of the current went into the smaller resistor R2 and only one-third went into R1. In other words, because R1 is twice as big as R2, the current in R2 is two times the current in R1. We can use an hydraulic example to qualitatively explain these results. An equivalent hydraulic circuit for this current divider could be a tube carrying some water that splits into two subtubes T1 and T2. The subtubes are not of the same size. On the contrary, because T2 is representing a resistor that is half the size as the other, the subtube will be twice as large. It is not hard to see how, in the scenario that I've just described, most of the water will prefer to flow into T2 just as two-thirds of the current prefers to flow into R2 rather than R1 in the electrical circuit. Finally, let's look at the corner case. Imagine that R2 is equal to zero. That is, the resistor is replaced with a short circuit. Or in the case of the hydraulic circuit, the second tube is replaced by an infinitely large tube. In this case, the equation tells us that no current will flow into R1 and that all the current will go into R2. A short circuit will therefore deprive the circuit of all of its current and cause a large amount of current to concentrate into a tiny wire. R1 will be zero and I2 will be equal to I bat. Note that not only I2 will be equal to I bat, but if you consider this specific circuit, the value of I bat will also become infinite, because now you are applying a voltage of a certain value, V bat, across a resistor equal to zero. So if you use Ohm's law, you can calculate that the current will become infinite. In real circuits, the current cannot really become infinite, but it will definitely become really large. That is why short circuits are so dangerous. They generate large current in small areas, and they often not only prevent the circuit from working as intended, but they can also start a fire and destroy the circuit.
In this lesson, we will talk about a very important principle of electronics, the superposition principle. This principle will help us to solve more complicated circuits. As indicated here, the principle says that for a linear circuit, the net response caused by two or more generators is equivalent to the sum of the responses that would have been caused by individual generators. Let's first define what is a linear circuit. A linear circuit is a circuit composed by linear components, such as resistors, capacitors, and inductors, plus voltage and current sources. For instance, the circuit on the left is a linear circuit, because it is entirely made of resistors, voltage sources, and current sources. Let's imagine that we want to calculate the value of the voltage V3 on the resistor R3. This seems quite a complicated endeavor, as more than one generator is acting on the circuit and will somewhat influence the outcome. How can we solve this problem? Here is where the superposition principle comes to save the day. The superposition principle tells us that, as long as the circuit is linear, one does not need to tackle the whole thing at once but the final result can be computed as the sum of the effects of the individual generators. On the right of the slide, I indicated a procedure one must follow to solve the circuit. Step 1. Turn off all generators by 1 and compute its effect on the desired node. Let's start by calculating the effect of VA. That means that we have to turn off IB and BC. How do we do that? Well, IB is a current source, so its job is to produce a current. Turning it off means setting the current to zero. A net, where the current is zero, is indistinguishable from an open circuit. So turning off a current generator is equivalent to removing it from the circuit and leaving the net open. VC is a voltage source. Its job is to generate a voltage. Turning it off, means setting the voltage to zero. A component that, no matter the current, always has a voltage drop of zero volt is indistinguishable from a wire. So turning off a voltage generator is equivalent to replacing it with a wire. So we are shorting VC out. Now that we have turned off IB and VC, we are left with the circuit with only one generator and a few resistors. This circuit is simple to solve. We recognize that R2 and R3 are in parallel, and that their parallel will generate a voltage divided with R1. So the contribution of VA to V3, a quantity that we can call V3A, will be equal to VA multiplied by R2 parallel R3 divided by R1 plus R2 parallel R3. Now, that the calculation of the contribute of one of the generators is complete, we can move on to the next one till we have considered all the generators in the circuit. At the end of the procedure, the final results for V3 will be given by the sum of each of the contributes. So V3 will be equal to V3A plus V3B plus V3C. Let's see an example. We consider the same circuit as before, but now we have assigned value to the components. The resistor resistance is 1 ohm, VA is plus 3 volts, IB is 3 amps in this direction, and VC is minus 1.5 volt. The incognita is still V3, the voltage across R3. On the right of the slide, I represent how the circuit is transformed when one turns off all generators but one. In case A, the only generator left is what was called VA. In case B, we keep only IB on. And finally, in case C, we consider the effect of VC. We have already discussed the effect of VA on V3. It's easy to calculate that with the numbers in this example, the contribute is equal to plus one volt. 
To calculate the factor of IB, we turn off both VA and VC by replacing them with short circuits. The 3 1 ohm resistor will now be in parallel with the 3 amp generator. We don't need to resort to any calculation here. The 3 amp current has three identical branches where it can go into, so it will evenly split between them. A 1 amp current into a 1 ohm resistor generates a voltage equal to 1 volt. The contribute of IB to the voltage V3 is also plus 1 volt. Lastly, we can compute the effect of VC. This case is similar to the first one. Once VA and IB are turned into a short and an open circuit, respectively, we are left with a single voltage divider. It is easy to calculate the contribute of VC to V3 is minus 0.5. Finally, the value of V3 when all generators are kept on is given by V3 equal to V3A plus V3B plus V3C, which in this case is equal to 1.5 volt. Simple, isn't it? If we had tried to solve the circuit keeping all three generators on, we would have had to write more complicated equations. Instead, thanks to the superposition principle, we can follow an easy procedure and determine the contributes from each of the generators and from that determine the final result. In this lesson, we will talk about ports in an electrical circuit. Any electrical circuit has at least one port. A port is a combination of two terminals of the circuit. In this example, I represent a simple voltage divider powered by a voltage source, like a battery, for example. The divider's output is then connected to RL, which is the load of the circuit. This can be seen as just one big circuit, but it can also be thought as made of different blocks that talk to each other and blocks talk to each other via ports. In this example, I added some white circle to individual ports and to divide the schematic in three different blocks. Here are the circle that I used to indicate terminals. The first block contains the battery. A battery does not have any input. It is the source of energy for the circuit so it only has one port. We could call it output port. This is the port. The second block is the voltage divider. This block has an input port where the voltage of the battery is applied and an output port, which is indicated by two terminals across R2. Finally, the last block is the load, which really only contains the resistor RL. This block also has only a single port. I want to highlight a few more things. A port is always defined by two terminals. The reason for this is that you need two points to define a voltage, and currents always need to have a return path. If you look at this port, for example, the one of the battery, the Kirchhoff current and low tell us that the current injected by the battery into the voltage divider must return from the other terminal. So if we call this one IB, we must have an IB coming back on the other terminal. Hence, a block without a second terminal will make no physical sense. Sometimes you will see blocks represented with one terminal only, but that is simply due to graphical simplification that assumes that the second terminal is either hidden or it is ground. Ports are also not fixed for a given circuit. You can literally define a port between any two nodes of the circuit if you like. 
In this example, one additional port could be the one whose terminals are around the resistor R1. So we could define this. This could be another port. However, in this case, the voltage on R1 does not seem to be used by the circuit. The load, in fact, is connected on R2. So defining this port will be at least curious, but there's nothing wrong with it. Splitting circuits in block and defining ports is an arbitrary process. One could have chosen to consider the battery and the voltage divider as one big block having only one output port. Like this. Just one block with an output port. One could even consider the whole circuit as a block with one output. The opposite extreme of this example would be if each of the components become its own block. But that is a rather pointless case, as you might as well look at the schematic at that point. The goal of dividing a circuit in blocks is to make it simpler to study. But where the line between one block and another is drawn is arbitrary and changes from person to person. For example, on the same project, the circuit designer will need to look at the detail of the schematic, while a system architect who is looking at the design from a higher point of view would prefer to study a block diagram to hide the details and focus on the bigger picture. In this lesson, we will talk about the Thevenin equivalent circuit. Let's consider a fairly complicated circuit composed of voltage sources, current sources, and resistors, like the one I represented on the left of this slide, this one. Then take a part of the circuit, that is, a pair of terminals connecting to it, like these two, and attach a load. In this case, I represented the load as a resistor-looking device in gray, but it could really be anything. This is the load. The circuit will have a certain effect on the load, namely, it will generate a certain voltage and current in the load. The Thevenin equivalent is a circuit composed by the series of a voltage source and a resistor. I represented it here. The theory says that one can find the value of the V equivalent and R equivalent such as this circuit is undistinguishable from the original circuit as seen from the load. That means that no matter what is the load that you consider, both circuits will always generate the same voltage and current in it. The two circuits are completely different internally, but from the point of view of what you can see, looking from that port, the two circuits look identical. If a circuit has more than one port, it will have, in general, different Thevenin equivalents for each of its ports. Thevenin equivalents are useful because they provide a level of abstraction and allow to ease the study and design of more complicated circuits. For instance, say that you want to connect not just a load, but another circuit to this port of this network, and you're wondering how the two circuits will work together. Wouldn't it be easier by replacing the first circuit with the Thevenin equivalent? Do you really need to know how all the voltages and currents inside the circuit move in order to determine how the circuit will interact from that port? The answer to this question is often no. Let me give you another perhaps silly example from daily life. To use a computer, do you need to know all the intricacies of the internal design? Do you need to know the model of the CPU, how much RAM it has, and how many resistors are used in its circuits? The answer is no. The operating system and your input devices, like the keyboard and the mouse, provide a level of abstraction and allow you to effectively move electrons around inside of your computer and all over the world via the internet without having to know how all of that works. Without this level of abstraction between internal circuit and the user, nearly no one will be able to use a PC. Alright, now the question is, how do you find the Thevenin equivalent of a circuit? 
Well, there is a procedure that you have to follow that is indicated here. Step one, disconnect the load. The Thevenin equivalent is meant to represent the circuit, the rest of the circuit, so the load cannot be part of it. So in this case, we will just eliminate this. Step number two, use the superposition principle to find what is the open circuit voltage, VOC, at the port under consideration. That will be the value of the generator V equivalent. So in this case, we have eliminated the load. Let me delete it. And now we will use the superposition principle to find the value of the voltage here. And this voltage is called VOC, V open circuit, and that will be equivalent to the V equivalent of the Thevenin equivalent circuit. Step three, turn off all the generators in the circuit and simplify the network of the resistors till you're left with one resistor at the output port. That will be the value of the resistance in the Thevenin equivalent circuit. So in this case, we will turn off all the generator, which means the current source becomes open, the voltage sources become shorts, and then all we are left is a network of resistor. And we can do series and parallel until we simplify it all, and we are just left with one resistor between the two terminals of the port that we are considering. The value of that resistance will be equivalent to the R equivalent of the Thevenin equivalent circuit. Not too difficult, isn't it? Well, you could argue that this was quite some work and that one might better spend it just to solve the circuit and to find the voltage across the load. Well, if your goal is simply to find the voltage on the load once and you're sure that the load will never change, then you're right. Determining the Thevenin equivalent of the circuit adds some overhead to an already complicated calculation. The Thevenin equivalent comes in handy, however, when the circuit can be used to drive different loads. Because once the Thevenin equivalent model is known, determining the voltage and the current on a new load is much, much easier than do the calculation all over again. Not only that, but the Thevenin equivalent circuit also allows you to compare how different circuits look from one of their port, something that is quite hard to do if the two circuits are complicated and significantly different. Let's look at an example. On the left, we have a fairly complex circuit with two generators and three resistors. And we want to find its Thevenin equivalent. Let's go step by step. Step one, remove the load. Done. Step two, find the value of V equivalent using the superposition principle. As you can see here, I've already done the work. On the left, I show the equivalent circuit when the current source is turned off. The circuit is a simple voltage divider that generates an output voltage of plus two volts. On the right, I did the opposite and turned off the voltage source instead. The resulting current divider generates a voltage drop equal to minus one volt. The value of the open circuit voltage VOC is therefore one volt. This is also the value of the equivalent terminal voltage. Step 3. All generators are off, and we need to simplify the network till a single resistor is left between the terminals of the output port that we are considering. We have three 1 ohm resistors here, in parallel with each other, hence the Thevenin equivalent resistance will be one third of 1 ohm, or about 333 milliohm. Now we can replace V equivalent and R equivalent with the respective values. This is the Thevenin equivalent of the circuit on the left, and it can be used to study the effect of this complicated network to any load or circuit that we might decide to connect to its output port.